Okay, so we're starting the second lecture of the semester, and this will be starting with chapter two. Last time we did all of chapter one in the introductory, and I have a question about what is positive feedback. Uh, probably first to talk about negative feedback. So negative feedback is the way that our body deals with most of maintaining homeostasis. And negative feedback was that image that I had. Let me pull it up. It was that image of like the thermostat, right? We're setting the house at 72 degrees, and... And so negative feedback refers to something like this, where as the body's blood sugar goes up, or as the blood pressure goes up, or as the uh, body temperature goes up, that at some point, something pushes it back down toward normal, usually a hormonal response. Something turns on and shoves it back. And it usually kind of overshoves it, if you will, down. And then as it gets too low, something then is also going to be turned on that will kick it back up. So the idea of negative feedback is that we're keeping the differences minimal. We're keeping everything within a box, right? We're keeping everything within a range. Positive feedback, and as I said, there's only a few examples of positive feedback in the body, uh, have to do with once the deviation begins to go further and further away from normal, it keeps on rolling. It's just like a snowball rolling and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so with uterine contractions, as the uterus starts to contract, there's really no mechanism in our body or in a woman's body to stop those uterine contractions. Once it starts, it goes to completion. The only way to really stop uterine contractions is to go to the hospital and get some medication. But once it starts, it's, a, it's, a, it's an all or none kind of process. It goes further and further toward completion. Same idea with that picture I showed you with the blood pressure, that blue this blue range represents the normal range, right? That's the normal range. Negative feedback would do what? As it got low, it would push it back up. As it got high, it would push it back down, and it would stay within this normal range. <coughs> Positive feedback, as the blood pressure starts to drop, it just keeps on going. In this case, why? Because there's a hemorrhage. There's a, a loss of blood to the point where it can't clot itself fast enough and the pressure continues to drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. And there's no way for, if you were to break your brachial artery or your femoral artery, a major artery, once it bleeds, you can't stop it. There's no way the body can stop that on its own. You would have to apply pressure and surgically fix that artery. The body itself cannot fix that, okay? So you're gonna die. So the blood pressure continues to go and blood pressure continues further and further away from normal. So that's positive feedback. Okay? The, the names don't make sense, do they? No, right? The body can't fix. So like <laughs> it almost seems like it, right? So negative feedback, we're not allowing things to become out of control. Keeping it right? normal. Keeping it normal. Keeping it within a range. Positive feedback, the ball just the rolls. Really beneficial one would be the one with the uterine contraction. Sure. It, it, sure, absolutely. Those are examples of positive feedback where there's just no mechanism to stop it once it starts. Okay. Yeah. But Good. <laughs> negative feedback's not negative. Negative feedback's really good, right? And positive feedback's not, not always. It, don't think that way. It doesn't okay. help you, right? It's just you got to hold on to these terms and, and make sense of it. But just remember that homeostasis is usually maintained by negative feedback. Okay? Good. Anything else? Anything else from Chapter 1? That was the atom to atom. Let's go through that continuum really quick. So if we start with atoms, atoms combined to make? Molecules like H2O, right? Water, CO2, right? And then those small molecules combine to make larger molecules referred to as Macromolecule. macromolecules. There's four groups of macromolecules. What are they? Carbs, lipids, Carbs, lipids uh, proteins, yeah. nucleic, acid. nucleic acids, DNA, RNA. Okay, so those macromolecules are then the building blocks for. Building blocks of cells, organelles, things like um, the smoothie, gold, yeah, the Golgi, smoothie ER, rough ER, ribosomes, mitochondria, all those things. Those organelles are the building blocks for the cells. Okay, yeah, yeah. cells, right? Those are the building blocks of cells. 
from cells. Cells then combine to make tissues. tissues. Four types of tissues. Epithelial. Epithelial. Connective. Muscle. Nervous. Four kinds of tissues. Those four kinds of tissues then combine to make organs, right? Heart, liver, kidney, brain. Now, those heart, liver, kidney, brains, those organs then combine to make organ systems, and the 11 organ systems combine to make you. Okay? That's a very important continuum. It's not that difficult, but we got to know it really well. Anything else in that conversation to review? Who has had a chance to go on and do chapter one mastering? A little bit? The homework? Or the dynamic study module? Perfect. What do you think? Not too bad. Good repetition. I was telling the group today in lab, I don't think I mentioned this on Monday, there's neuroscience research out there that says to be successful in a course like anatomy and physiology where there's a lot of detail, a lot of repetition, you must interact with the material at least seven times, minimum seven times to, to learn it. So first time, maybe lecture. Second time, pre-lab, you're going to see a lot of the same stuff come up in pre-lab. Third time, in lab. Fourth time, studying for the quiz for the lab quiz. Fifth time, homework online and maybe a couple different kinds of assignments. That's maybe five and six. Seventh time, the quiz that's going to be online. Eighth or ninth time, finally, the exam. So it's going to, t and, and, and what, I, what I want to avoid, and you may feel differently about this, but I don't want to hear anyone say mastering was busy work. The busy work to me, at least for this course, is code for repetition. And repetition is exactly what you need. Right? It does take repetition to master all of these facts. So when you're doing the mitosis for the third time, or you're learning the femur for the third time on an online activity, just charge through it and feel good about it and say, OK, this is max. One more chance for me to learn this well so I can show off when I get to the exam. So really in, embrace mastering. Embrace the repetition. I know it's a lot of work. I know it's a lot of repetition, but it, it's, again, it's it's, we know that it's necessary. Nationally, 50% of all students fail AMP1. Nationally. We're well above that. And part, I think, because of the way we have things structured, not that we're so fantastic, but I think we've got things structured with enough repetition, and I'm actually trying to increase that repetition so our rates go higher. I want to see greater success. Okay? And the fact that you guys are here is a good sign. All right? There's a lot of people who aren't here. So I'm glad you're here, and uh, hopefully all this repetition is going to pay off. Okay, anything else in chapter one? Anything housekeeping? Anything at all worried about housekeeping? Everyone's in mastering? They are you all set now in mastering? Are you enrolled? Thea, are you, are you enrolled now in mastering? Okay, I'll help you after class, okay? Anybody else having trouble getting into mastering? Very good. So let's jump over to chapter two. Actually, before I do that, what do I owe you? Some vocab, right? And we did the first five slides last time. Remember that on the first exam, it's going to be the first 20 slides. Yes, ma'am. Do, do you have any idea what you're going to post that quiz? For? For the lab. Lab one? Yes. Yeah. I'm probably going to be working on it tonight and tomorrow. It'll be posted by the end of the week. And normally, you wouldn't, quote, take that quiz until next week, right, at the lab. So I know you're kind of anxious. But yeah, I'll get to it. It's going to be very soon. Okay. Okay. If I promised something, I could break it, and I wouldn't feel good. So I'm not going to promise 8 o'clock tonight, but it will be very soon. Okay. Okay. Because it'll be the quiz for I'm lab. Right? Curious with the holiday I know. And I'll probably make it very late. I'll probably <coughs> make it due later next week so that you do have, I mean, it won't be Monday, right? I mean, nothing's going to be due on Monday if you have Monday lab because that's a holiday. So it definitely will be later in okay. the week, no doubt about that. So don't worry about getting it done before the weekend. It'll be there okay. later for next week. But I'll try to have it done there before the weekend starts. OK, anything else on chapter one? Any housekeeping? OK, let's take a look. Uh, vocabulary number six through 10 today. Anti, before, antipartum, right, before birth. Antibrachial, kind of before the brachium. It doesn't always make sense, I don't think, in that way. But remember, the antibrachium is what? The, the forearm, right? And the antecubital region is the area kind of in the in, inside of your elbow. Against, anti, against. An anticoagulant is a, is a molecule that is going to provide protection or prevent or go against blood clotting. 
APO to be separated from, and APS and APT, uh, fit or fasten. Now, in this example, synapse. You know what a synapse is? <coughs> Synapse is where two cells come very, very close to each other. When we think about the nervous system, we'll talk about a synapse where the neuron, the cell of the nervous system, comes in close contact with a muscle, and that's going to cause the muscle to contract. Those cells come into very close contact. Syn, S-Y-N, means together. Apps, fit or fasten. So synapse, literally, where two cells fit or fasten closely together. And AR. It also is a negating term. So we had A, AN, and AR. You could throw them all on one slide if you wanted to on one post-it note or uh, flashcard because they all mean without, as in the example of arrhythmia, right, having an, a, without a normal rhythm. Archie, the beginning of something or the origin of something. Monarchy, the first menstruation, as example. Arthro, arthritis. Inflammation, itis, inflammation of the joints. An arthropod, right, an organism with large feet and joint structures. There's a typo on here. This should be atrio, so get rid of the first R. So get rid of that first R. This should be atrio, and this means entryway. The atria, or an atrium, is the entryway into your heart and your church or your home. You may describe the entryway as the atrium. If something ends in A-R-Y, it's usually associated with something. So urinary associated with urine. Today, I think, or certainly next time, uh, we'll be discussing enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that facilitate and push along chemical reactions, and not always. But oftentimes, proteins end in ASE. So if you see a term ending in ASE, like polymerase or kinase or any other ACE, it's almost always an enzyme. ASIS or ASIA. Um, if you see homeostasis, it ends in ASIS. It's a state or condition of homeo, staying relatively the same. And then asthen is weakness. Myasthenia, weakness of muscle, right? Myo is muscle. So myasthenia, muscle weakness. Athero, atherosclerosis. Athero means fat. Sclero, hard, right? Osis, an abnormal condition. So atherosclerosis literally means an abnormal condition where then some things, right, the, um, there's a hardening caused by buildup of fat, right, atherosclerosis, a uh, major cause of cardiovascular disease. Audio, hearing, ari, the ear, the outside of your ear, the flappy part, it's called the auricle. And auto, self. So autolysis would be breaking down of self, automobile, literally, movement of self, right, uh, and then the last ones for today, barrow, weight or pressure, uh, bariatric, uh, bariatric surgery, surgery to help lose uh, weight, a barometer, right, something that measures atmospheric pressure, Benny, good or well, benign. If you hear that you have a benign tumor, that's pretty good news. Uh, benign, right, means it's probably not going to kill you. And benediction, a good word. And then bi, twice or double. So bicuspid has two points to it, tooth, um, bicycle, right, two, two wheels, we know bi. And then finally, bio, here we are in a biology class learning about life. So life, bio, life, and ology, the study of. So we're just going to keep building our vocabulary. Again, last time I told you an example of how I would approach this is I'll just take these two terms and put them together. So last time I showed you a term with ambi and algia, both on the same slide, and I said for two points, what does ambi algia mean? And having looked at these terms, you know that ambi means both sides, and algia means pain. Okay? So I'll, this is exactly how I'll do it. That will be fill in the blank. On the exam, most of the tests will be fill, uh, multiple choice, but there will be some fill in the blank, not much, and the vocabulary is usually fill in the blank. So it would be, what does this word mean? Pencil, right? Write it out. Um, other things on the exam, just be thinking about it. 
There'll be a few PowerPoint images during the exam that you'll be labeling things that we've seen, things that we've directly seen in class on the PowerPoints. And ah, there'll be a case study. That's not something you can study for, but I'll give you a little story to read and you'll answer some questions. Pretty straightforward. So that's kind of what to anticipate. Oh, and also the Darley. Remember that first page that was uh, in your packet? And it said this is how to approach learning and active versus passive learning, if you had a chance to read that. I'll ask you a couple questions about that. That would be a short answer right out. Other than that, the test will be largely multiple choice. OK, so that's our vocab through 10. I'm going to owe you through 20, aren't I? So I'll make sure I get through all 20 before our first test. What was that last term, cusp? Right, A through cusp on the first test. There's something about this word chemistry that brings fear into people's lives. And maybe some of you right now are sweating just a little bit more. You're OK with biology, but this thing chemistry drives you crazy. Um, just for a show of hands, who has had, in the last couple of years, a high school chemistry class or a college chemistry class? OK. Who has not? OK. When you hear the word chemistry, does it make you nervous? Good. I literally have seen people start sweating. Uh, now. We're not going to become chemists here. So those who have had chemistry class, just sit back and you know, kind of enjoy the ride. Um, those who haven't had chemistry, my job is to start this off at the very lowest level that I can and know that you're, you're okay if you haven't had any chemistry. And um, we just need to understand enough about chemistry to appreciate that atom to atom continuum. So I need to start off with atoms and talk about molecules. And we'll also in this unit be talking about carbs and lipids and proteins and nucleic acids and how those are important molecules in the making of your cells and your body. So that's where we're going, or that's where we're going to be today. I may finish this chapter today, and if I don't, there'll be a little bit left over for next time. Keep in mind, our first exam is not next week, but the following week, right? And it's going to cover chapter one, which I've already finished, chapter two, I may or may not finish it today, and the material from lec uh, lab one. So the body cavities, the directional terms, all of that conversation, that you covered in lab one, not the microscope, but all the anatomy stuff, will be part of the first exam as well, plus vocab one through 20. OK, so let's get into this chemistry chapter. So here's that atom to atom continuum. I've already reviewed this with you. And really what we're doing today is we're going to be talking about atoms and molecules. When we get to chapter uh, three, we'll be talking about tissues and cells and organelles. So we're going to be going up this continuum. We'll finally get to tissues in about 10 days or so, two weeks. And then from that point on, we'll be looking at organs and organ systems for the rest of the semester. So let me help prove to you, I hope, that it is important that we look at a little bit of chemistry. So we've already talked about cells. We know cells are the most fundamental living thing in our body. And if we work backwards, right? Cells are made up of organelles, and organelles are made up of macromolecules, right? And macromolecules are made up of molecules and atoms. So again, if Aristotle was right that complex things are made of less complex things, then we need to appreciate this continuum, and that's why I'm going to put you through this um, chapter. Now back to a little bit of a chemistry lesson. Um, if you hear someone say matter, what is matter? I mean, no, this is one of those definitions you learn somewhere in middle school that you memorize, I'm sure. Matter is what? Anything that uh, occupies space and has mass, right? Somewhere in the back of your mind, you've heard that definition. It was drilled into you on a couple of different grade levels. So you know that. And um, so what is mass then? We know what space means, but what is mass? It has weight. OK, so we use that word weight commonly. And in chemistry class, you'll more use the word Mass. How are they different? I've got it on here, but do we know what the difference is? If I step on my bathroom scale, right, I see a number. I'm not very happy. I take my bathroom scale and I go up to Kilimanjaro, right, Mount Everest, someplace, and I step on my bathroom scale. Am I going to weigh the same? At higher altitudes, it's less gravity, so I would weigh less because weight is the effect of gravity down on the scale. If I took my bathroom scale and I go to the moon and I step on it, what am I going to weigh? Essentially, zero. zero. 
But if I bring my bathroom mirror with me and I look in the mirror, <laughs> I'm still there. So the weight is an effect of gravity. And that can change from the moon to the mountains to the sea level. Whereas mass, I look in the mirror, I'm still there, <laughs> right? It's my space that I take up, right? And, and all the stuff that makes me up. So that's the difference, right? Weight is a gravitational force down on something. And mass is that thing that takes up space, you and me. Now, what is it that's taking up this space? The most fundamental thing that we had in our hierarchy were atoms. And I showed you that periodic table. Remember that periodic table, that box, that bunch of squares and boxes? And I said all of the elements of the Earth are located here like gold and silver and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. Those are all the elements. And if I had a pure chunk of gold, it would be made up of only what? Gold atoms. And if I had a big chunk of pure carbon, it would be made up of carbon atoms. So atoms are that fundamental thing of which all things are made. There's about 112 or so elements on that periodic table. There are some new ones being made, but they're made in the laboratory, very short-lived by Russians and people you know, at um, high-end laboratories. There's only about 20 elements on the Earth necessary for life. They're the ones you find on your, medicine, on your uh, vitamin bottle. So a little copper, a little magnesium, a little manganese, you know, all of those things that you find on your vitamin bottle are the same 20 or so um, elements that are necessary in small amounts for life. And of those 20, really four make up the majority of us. So 96% of our body, if you were to sell your body on Amazon for its elements, is made up of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And those are very common, so they have very little value. So I've, been, I've heard it said, that our body sold on the chemistry market is worth about six bucks, right? We don't have a whole lot of copper and gold in us. We have a little bit, but not much. So we're worth about six bucks on the, on the black market for our body parts, the atoms, right? Your kidneys are worth a lot more. Now, so atoms, right, these little ball structures that we see in the cartoons, they are the thing that we started our conversation with. And I kind of lied when I said we're going to start only at atoms because we need to break it down even further and figure out what is an atom made up of to really make sense of this conversation that we're going to have today about how molecules work in our body. So we need to understand that an atom is composed of a nucleus. Now, when you hear the word nucleus in a biology class, a nucleus is typically what? Kind of the center of the cell where the DNA hangs out, right? That's what we think of as a nucleus. Well, chemists also stole that, that word. And so the nucleus is the very center, the very core of the atom. And around that nucleus is a lot of space. And in that space is where the electrons hang out. Electrons are tiny, 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 right? Sub-microscopic little things that are floating around outside the nucleus. In this cartoon, I don't want you to think about this being a two-dimensional flat cartoon. But instead, if you can't imagine, this is a three-dimensional sphere, OK? So that sphere represents the atom. And that little red dot represents the nucleus of that atom. That sphere is largely space, mostly empty space. But out in that blue, hazy sphere is where the electrons hang out. In that very center nucleus, is where the protons are going to hang out. So we're going to talk about three things here, electrons, protons, and neutrons. That will be as far down as we go, OK? There's more to it. You can take that in a physics class. So we're going to have electrons out here in the hazy blue area. And shoved in this very small nucleus, we're going to have positively charged protons and neutrally charged, right, no charge, neutrons. As an analogy, if you were at the University of Michigan, or my alma mater, the University of Florida, some big college football stadium, and you were to hang something in the scale, I've heard anything from a garden pea to a golf ball to an orange or a grapefruit, and you were to hang that somehow over the 50-yard line from, the, from this guy, kind of in the center of the stadium, the stadium would represent the area of the atom. That grapefruit hanging from the 50-yard line would represent the size of the nucleus. So it's a very tiny, little, compact nucleus 
with all the space, and the electrons are hanging out in the seats, right? They're kind of the, in the seating sections of the stadium. So that kind of gives you an idea of the scope of how much space there is and how little space there is for the nucleus. So let's talk about these three subatomic particles, these things under the atom, things that make up the atom. Again, there's the proton. The proton is going to oftentimes be abbreviated just P plus, a reminder of the plus that these are positively charged. They have a positive charge. <laughs> For example, um, and I should say the number of protons absolutely defines the atom's identity. So hydrogen is the very first atom, very, very first element, and all of the hydrogen atoms will have one and only one proton. So any atom that has one proton in its nucleus is going to be, by definition, hydrogen. Carbon, for example, has six protons in its nucleus. If it's anything different than six, it's not carbon. So the number of protons is the defining part to saying, is it carbon, is it oxygen, is it nitrogen? It's the number of protons that defines it. Okay, and they're all squeezed into the nucleus. Then there's another subatomic particle mm -hmm. called a neutron. Now these names got their charge, their names by their charges. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons are neutral. So they are sometimes abbreviated <laughs> N superscript zero, no charge, neutral. They also are squeezed into the nucleus with the protons. They are going to contribute to the, quote, mass of the atom, how much space it takes up and what its, you know, uh, its space and its mass. Now, so we talk about the atom's mass, the atomic mass, that is going to be the addition of the protons and the neutrons. For example, carbon has in its nucleus always, always, always six protons. Most carbon atoms also have six neutrons in the nucleus. So we have six and six, six protons, six neutrons. That adds up to a mass of 12. Okay, we're not going to become chemists here, but that's just the basic the basic arithmetic here. So we're going to say that the average carbon atom has a mass of 12. Six from the protons, six from the neutrons. That's in that little squeezed center proton, or a nucleus. Now, floating out in the, in the stadium, out in all the space of all the seats and in all the empty space, are some electrons. Those electrons are negatively charged, so they're E negative and they're found out somewhere in that blue haze or out in that stadium seating. They're kind of ran, running around. Now, the electrons have assigned sections, though, okay? So they're not just anywhere. They will be, as we'll understand, assigned to certain sections of the stadium. We won't get into that too much, but I just want you to kind of appreciate this analogy a little bit more. So let's kind of look at a cartoon of this. The, on the far left-hand side, this is a hydrogen atom. You're not going to have to memorize any of these numbers. I will always share with you what the numbers are. Hydrogen's the first atom or the first element. Carbon's the sixth. But you do need to understand where they're found and what the relationship is. So the very first element on the chart is hydrogen. Hydrogen has, number one, one proton in its nucleus. If an atom has one proton in its nucleus, it has to be hydrogen. And oh, by the way, so that's what the dark center is, one proton and one electron, okay? one electron out on the outside. No neutrons, no neutrons. Neutrons don't always have to be there and their numbers can be variable. The average carbon atom, six protons, and as I mentioned before, also six neutrons. So what's the mass of carbon? 12, and six little electrons, okay? Out in the, out in the, in the blue fog. Then, as another example, oxygen, eight protons and eight neutrons. Its mass would be 16. And it also has eight electrons out in the shell, out in the, in the, in the haze. So let's fill this blank in. Uh, the, first of all, the atomic number is the number of protons. So hydrogen, its atomic number is one. It has one proton. Carbon, its atomic number is? Six, it has six protons. Oxygen will always have eight, so its atomic number is eight. 
the periodic table set up that way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. When it comes to, let's fill this sentence in. Since electrons are negative, right, I'm telling you that, E negative, and all atoms, I'm telling you, are electrically neutral, that means that the atomic number is the what as the number of electrons? Yeah, it's the same as, right? Because what's another word for atomic number? Atomic number is the number of protons, right? So another way of saying is, I'm telling you that all atoms that we dig up in the backyard are going to be electrically neutral. So that means the number of positive charges will equal the number of negative charges. The number of protons, the atomic number, will equal the number of electrons. So it will be the same as or equal to the number of electrons. Fair so far? So, if I've got some gold, if I've got some silver, I have some copper, some oxygen, some hydrogen, whatever it is, what is it that makes a bunch of gold atoms different from a bunch of silver atoms? The number of protons. So that's that number of protons that is fundamentally defining each atom. So that's protons, right? That's what's going to define the atom. What about neutrons? And I'm telling you now that neutrons can vary. Right? They're neutral in charge, and their number is different, numerous, however you want to think about it. In medicine, isotopes are very, very important. Anybody going into radiography again or into imaging? Okay. So nuclear medicine is a huge field, and I mentioned the PET scan last time, and I said we take some radioactive glucose and we inject it into a person, and we can watch those hot spots or cold spots light up. That's using isotopes. Isotopes are also used in, you know, um, nuclear reactors and things like that. But isotopes are atoms with a variable number of neutrons. And so we would say that an isotope, right, it's, this, it's still carbon. It still has six protons, right? It's carbon. But it has a variable number of neutrons. And that would be an isotope of carbon. And many, not all, but most, many, Isotopes are kind of unstable. They tend to break down. They tend to change over time. And that's exactly how we do nuclear medicine. That's how we do radioisotope labeling of how old things are on the Earth. We look at how this isotope changes over time, and then we kind of do some backtracking to determine how old something is. Or in medicine, when they give you some sort of radio label and they're looking for something in your body, you're kind of hot for a few days, right? You're hot. And over time, you become less radioactive. So when you first go to the doctor and you have a test like that done, they tell you, don't hold your kids, don't go hug anybody, stay kind of isolated for a day or two until the level of radioactivity decreases. Okay, so those are isotopes. They're simply atoms with a variable number of neutrons, and that's really all I want us to understand for now. We'll put this into a picture for you. And so there are, it turns out, three isotopes of hydrogen. Okay, three isotopes of hydrogen. Regular old hydrogen, one proton, no neutrons, mass of one. But there's a variation of hydrogen called deuterium. It's an isotope of hydrogen. Well, it's hydrogen. So how many protons are there? Has to be only one. This version happens to have one neutron also squozen, squeezed into the nucleus. So it has a total mass of two, and therefore its name, deuterium, deuce. There's also another form of hydrogen, another variation, another isotope. It's called tritium, three. It has to have one proton because it's hydrogen. The other two come from two neutrons. Okay? So that's what would be, that would be, this would be what would be inside the nucleus, right? Just a proton. Here we get a proton and a neutron. Here we have a proton and two neutrons, making up that isotope. Another idea of an isotope, using carbon. Carbon-12, I've already described to you. That's your normal, basic, regular carbon. That's the one that has six protons always, and I've told you a couple times, also has six neutrons. It has a total mass of 12, so we call it carbon-12. But there's a variation on this theme called carbon-14. And carbon-14, right, it's still carbon, so it must have six protons, but it 
has eight neutrons. That's where the 14 comes from. Again, that carbon 14, sorry about the light, the carbon 14 is unstable and would break down over time. And it's part of that carbon 14 that is used for radio labeling and figuring out how old some things are on the planet. Looks like the bulb's going out, doesn't it? I'll put that report in. So that's isotopes. So we've dealt with protons. The number of protons in the nucleus equals the identity of the atom. I've told you a little bit about neutrons. They, their numbers can vary. We call those variations isotopes, and they're usually unstable. Now we're going to turn our attention to electrons. And this is really where we need to focus a little bit more attention. So electrons, well, I should say, I should read this to you first. When atoms combine, when oxygen and hydrogen combine to make water, right? Because H2O, right? When we take, to make, to make, hydro, to make water, what do we have to have? Two hydrogens. Two hydrogens and an oxygen, right? And so when those atoms combined, there's always going to be an interaction of electrons. And I'll, I'll, I'll help you with this. So when atoms combine or break apart, there's always going to be um, a movement of electrons. And we're going to say that's a chemical reaction. So any chemical reaction in your body, when you take in food and your body from it makes energy, all those chemical reactions are really dealing with the movement of atoms from one another and a lot of chemical reactions. <coughs> I told you that electrons are out in the shell. They're out in the blue haze. They're out in the stadium. And I tried to convince you briefly that those electrons are not a sign. They're not just randomly floating anywhere. They're not my kids, right, everywhere. They're assigned to certain sections of the stadium. And those sections of the stadium are called shells. They're referred to as electron shells. And so imagine just like an M&M is, you know, dipped in layers of chocolate and then the coating, there's many shells that make up the stadium layers of seats. In chemistry, one of the foundational rules is that an atom wants its outer shell filled. Just remember that. An atom wants its outer shell filled with electrons to its capacity to be, quote, stable. Okay. So we want a stable outer shell or an outer orbital. Same thing, shell or orbital. That's an important phrase to keep in mind. So let's use carbon as an example and figure out what this means. Carbon, we know, is the sixth element. It has six protons in its nucleus. So there's an answer, right? How many protons? Six. Atoms are neutral, so how many electrons? Six. So we got that down. Let's draw this. Let's, let's draw this, and you have it all in front of you, I know. But let's watch this step by step. So this little green circle represents the nucleus. In the nucleus, six protons and six neutrons. That's going to be carbon-12, the boring, regular, normal kind of carbon. There are these shells around the nucleus. The first shell, and I know it's shown as a two-dimensional circle, but imagine this is a candy coating sphere, right, all the way around. That first shell is kind of small, and it has a maximum capacity of two electrons. That's an always, always true. So the first shell, kind of small, small seating area, can only hold two electrons. So there they are, one and two, E1, E1, or e, e minus and E minus. So after the first shell, it can only hold two, there must be a second shell. That's what's shown here. How many electrons are left? Four. The second shell can hold eight. Okay? That's always a rule. First shell only holds two. The second shell can hold eight. Is carbon happy? No. Right? It only has four in its outer shell. And I told you that in chemistry, things want to have their outer shell filled. So what would carbon want to do? Gain four or lose four because when the shell's empty, it's like you erase it, it's gone. Okay? So carbon, therefore, is the perfect building block for our biochemistry. 
and that's why we say we're carbon-based life forms, because carbon is perfectly arranged that it can gain for or lose for or any combination thereof, and that creates a perfect mole, a perfect atom to build our carbs, our proteins, our, our lipids, and our nucleic acids, right? So carbon is the building block of most of our biochemistry because, right, it's so flexible. Gain a four, lose four. So we have the inner shell, the outer shell, and, and that's all I'm going to talk about right now for carbon. And we'll continue to talk about this a little bit. Now, when two atoms combine, there's always going to be an interaction of the electrons in the outer shell of those atoms with each other. Now, there's a couple different ways that atoms can combine. There's what we call ionic bonding, ionic bonds, and then there'll be covalent bonds in a moment. So basically, when two molecules, sorry, when two atoms, like two hydrogens and an oxygen, combine to make water, there's going to be some accounting going on to figure out where these electrons are. Those electrons can either be transferred, literally moved from one shell to another, or they can be shared. So I'm going to start off with um, gaining or losing electrons. This is called an ionic bond. When I hear this word ionic bond, I just kind of go back to, I think it was around 10th or 11th grade. I took a Western civilization course in high school. And I remember ionic columns. I don't know why. I always remember this. Ionic columns, some sort of Greek or Roman architectural statue style, right? <laughs> ionic columns. And then I'm reminded, well, both the Greeks, and I forget, forgive me. I don't remember if it was Greek or Roman, right? The ionic columns. I think it's Greek. But anyway, the Greeks were rather warring people, and they were out conquering lands, and they were transferring goods, right? T conquering, taking over. So that's what I kind of remember. So ionic bonds are the gaining or the losing, sort of like the warring Greeks, of electrons. The example that I want you to keep in mind for an ionic bond is sodium chloride, NaCl. You know sodium chloride. It's our table salt. Okay. Now, what's going on here is that the electrons are going to be transferred. I know this is a little bit small to see, but let's work through this. <coughs> sodium is the 11th element. So what does that tell us? Its atomic number is 11. Therefore, it has in its nucleus 11 protons. It also has in its shells... How many electrons? 11. Chlorine is the 17th element. Therefore, it has 17 protons in its nucleus and 17 electrons out in the orbitals. Let's think about sodium for a second. Where are those 11 electrons? Imagine first shell, 2. In the second shell, it holds eight. How many electrons have I used up? Ten. There's 11 electrons. The third one has to go to the, or the last one has to go to the third shell. And it's sitting out there all by itself. Okay? So what would sodium want to do? Get rid of it, right? If you get rid of that one electron, then it's like the outer shell's gone. And now the second shell is the outer shell, and it's full. Chlorine, 17, 2, then 8, then 7. Now, let me tell you a little fib here. Those who've had chemistry, don't tell anything. Don't tell your chemistry props. The third shell holds 8, too, for our purposes. The third shell holds 8. So what does chlorine want to do? Gain 1. Okay, perfect, right? So these are a perfect match, aren't they? So what's sodium going to do? give one away, chlorine is going to happily take it. So now sodium's happy and chlorine's happy. Perfect match. That's exactly what happens here. So look what happens. That extra electron in the sodium, sodium loses an electron. That means that sodium, still sodium, has 11 protons. It lost an electron. Now it only has 10 electrons. Overall now, the positive and negative charges don't match. Overall, sodium now has what charge? Positive. positive one. Right? There's more positive charges than there are negative charges. So we say that sodium 
is plus one, and the one is usually ignored, we'd say sodium plus. Chlorine, what did it do? It took that electron, it gained it, it ionically conquered it, right? So what happens? It still has 17 protons, it's still chlorine. But it has 18 electrons, it took that extra one in. It now has one more negative charges, one more negative charge than positive. So chlorine has an overall charge of one negative or just negative. We call these ions. So when you're unbalanced, and now you have a negative or a positive charge, these are called ions, ionic bond, right? So it kind of goes, think about it in any kind of ways, but ionic bonds are where these little negative and positive charges are attracted to each other in close proximity. So when sodium and chloride come together, you create a crystal of tightly bound sodium and chloride ions that has a little, tasty, a little tastiness to it, right? A little salt. It's really interesting. Sodium's a metal in its natural state. Chlorine's a poisonous gas in its natural state. Put them together, you get salt, right? Kind of cool. But why do they come together so wet readily and so wonderfully? Because one has a positive charge, one has a negative charge. Boom, perfect little magnets. They come together nicely. Fair enough? Now, in lab two, the one that we're not going to be doing together, that you're going to be doing kind of online, and you're still going to be reading through the pre-lab activities for lab two, and you're still going to be turning in the pre-lab for lab two, not next week, but in two weeks. You're going to turn that pre-lab into me. One of the activities you're going to be doing in that Ammerman pre-lab is playing with electrons, specifically with sodium chloride. So I am only going to be expecting you guys in my class to know the same stories that I'm sharing with you. So I'm talking about sodium chloride as an example of an ionic bond. Sodium chloride and is the story you need to know for the chemistry pre-lab and for the exam. If this were a chemistry class, right, I'd make up something you've never seen before and said, here, figure it out. But here, I'm going to say, this is what we've talked about. This is what I want you to understand. Please tell me about it on the exam. So that's ionic bond. Then there's covalent bonds. This is not where the electrons are taken over, but where instead they are shared. If you rearrange the word covalent in there, you will find the word love, right? And when you love each other, you share. It's kind of just another way to remember this. Now, there's two different types of covalent bonds. There's where things are shared evenly, and there are where things are shared unevenly, like my kids, okay? So I'm gonna start off with the shared evenly story. And we're going to call this a, um, a covalent bond, right? Because what, what we've got here is a molecule called hexane. What's a hexagon? Yeah, six sides. So hexane is a molecule. Oops. Hexane is a molecule with six carbons in it. You're never going to have to rearrange this or write this out, but just figure out what this is coming from. So we see six carbons, okay? And there's a bunch of hydrogens around it. Now, we're not going to count electrons here, but I assure you that if you were to count electrons, every one of those carbons is now fully, has a full outer shell, and each of those hydrogens has a full outer shell, not because they conquered and shared, not because they conquered electrons, but because they are now claiming the electrons and sharing them with each other. All of those carbons and hydrogens are equally sharing the electrical charges. So everyone's sharing equally. It's like a little commune. It's perfect. Okay, but more often than not, the charges will not be completely shared evenly. And so this is going to be a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay, so that one, sorry, the one we just did was a nonpolar. When you hear the word polar, what comes to mind? Bipolar, magnets, polarity. White bears, right? Something like that. So the North and South Pole, right? So polarity suggests that things are different. So nonpolar suggests that they are, quote, the same. So that hexane, where everything's being shared equally, is a nonpolar covalent bond. So if you want to go back and put nonpolar above this, just to be clear, that's a nonpolar covalent bond. Everything's being shared equally. There is no polarity. 
and that's the example I want you to know for nonpolar covalent hexane, versus a polar covalent bond. Water is our example for a polar covalent bond. We've got hydrogen, two of them, and oxygen. They're stuck together. They are sharing electrons, but the sharing is uneven. So if we look at this little cartoon with the red and the, and the green, and we look at the little key on this, it says that the, the green is positive and the red is negative. So this line, this solid line, H to O, that is a covalent bond. That's what that line represents is a covalent bond, a sharing of electrons. But if you look at this overall color scheme on this molecule, you see that the hydrogens are kind of more positive and the oxygen is more negative. Yes, they're sharing. Yes, it's covalent, but they're not sharing equally, leaving the molecule with some polarity, some variation in charge. This is very important to understand with water because this is what gives water its unique properties. Another kind of bond, and a, and a physicist or a chemist would argue with me this isn't a bond, but biologists talk of hydrogen bonds as well. Each of these little squiggle things here is a water molecule. So there's a hydrogen, there's a hydrogen, there's an oxygen. So this is the water, this is the water, this is the water molecule. If you look closely, I know it's hard to read, it has this little sign delta positive and delta negative. What that's saying is that there's a little bit of difference, a little polarity going on. So the oxygens are a little bit negative, the hydrogens are a little bit positive. Well, what do you think happens now when you put water together? When you put water molecules next to another water molecule, the little negatives are attracted to little positives. Right? So there's still some attraction going on, and that attraction is called a hydrogen bond and is shown here by these dotted lines. So the dotted lines between water molecules are hydrogen bonds. The solid lines within the water molecule are the covalent bonds. This is why when you fill up a glass to the very, very top, you can almost overfill the glass, and you'll see that water dome over the very top of the glass because those water molecules are doing what? Sticking to each other. There's polarity. There, there's adhesion to each other. This is why small insects can walk on water. And this is why when, belly, when you belly flop, it hurts. And this is why if you jump off a bridge, even at 60 feet, I think 60 feet is about the cutoff, you're going to die, right? Because no matter what you do, when you jump into that water, I mean, if you stick your finger in a glass of water, it doesn't hurt. You do a belly flop, and all of a sudden you realize it hurts. What's happening? All of this energy, all these hydrogen bonds suddenly are being interrupted, and you feel that impact as a belly flop. And if you jump from, I think it's over 60 or 70 feet, your bones are going to break as you fall into the water. No matter if you're a pencil, you know, going in feet first with a pencil, you're still likely going to sustain some life-ending um, damage. So that's hydrogen bonds, covalent bonds, ionic bonds. What do you think? Are we okay with those? Again, when you're doing the pre-lab for lab two, there'll be a conversation about covalent bonds, and it'll be about water and about hexane. So if this story is making sense to you, yay, no problem. You're in good shape. If this story is like, well, I'm not sure I get this, you're going to get a chance to practice it in the pre-lab. And again, these are the same uh, examples I'll want you to know for the exam. Any questions on this? Those who've had chemistry, feeling okay about it? Am I doing okay? Um, makes sense from what you've been told in the past? So we talked about atoms and how atoms combine, right, to make molecules. So what's a molecule? Two or more atoms combine, right? H2O, CO2. You can also have a compound. I'm not going to get excited about this, but molecules are one or more atoms combined. Compound, two or more different types of atoms combined. This C6H1206, anybody know what this is? Yeah, that's just good old glucose or a basic sugar. Uh, it's going to have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens all combined together. And all their little electrons are arranged in just the right way to allow this molecule to, to be stable enough to survive. Okay. Question? No. no. So, dissociation. What happens 
when you put salt into water? It sinks, dissolves, and the new word for the day is going to be, it's going to dissociate. It's kind of the same thing. Okay, we think of it dissolving. Dissociate, dissociating is the word we're going to be using from a chemistry standpoint. So what's going on? When I pour some salt into, or sugar, right, but we'll think about salt right now. When I pour salt into a glass, it dissociates, it separates. What's going on? It's actually the attraction of the water molecules that's causing this dissociation to occur. Let's look at a visual of this. Remember water, this little Mickey Mouse, right, this little Mickey Mouse in the bottom, and the little, um, the red, the red is the oxygen, remember? And the oxygen has a little bit of a negative charge to it, doesn't it? And the blue ears are the hydrogens, and they have each a little bit of positiveness to them. Okay. So this cartoon, a beaker of water, a huge <laughs> chunk of salt. That salt really is what? It is a bunch of sodium and chloride ions that are connected together through that positive and negative interaction. That's like a little salt crystal. But when I put that salt crystal into water, look what happens. Some of these sodiums are going to dissociate. Some of these chloride ions are going to dissociate. And look what happens to them. Sodium is positive, right? Look at the arrangement of the Mickey Mouses around that. All the negative oxygens are being partially attracted to that positive sodium. Now look at the water molecules as they surround the chloride ion. The chloride was negative. Now it's those little positive hydrogens that are in association with it. So you keep adding salt to the water, and it keeps dissociating. It keeps dissolving. But then what happens at some point? You, keep, you add salt in, and now it is saturated. It will no longer dissolve. It will no longer dissociate. What do I do? If I want more salt to dissociate or dissolve, what can I do? Add more. Add more water. That's cheating. What else could I do? Stir it. And when I stir it, what am I doing? Creating more opportunities for little Mickey Mouses, right, to rearrange themselves around sodiums and chlorides. And I stir. And that will dissolve more, won't it? What's the other trick I could do? Heat it up. And what happens when you heat things? The molecules are vibrating more. Again, we're creating more of these opportunities for the sodium and the chlorines to dissociate from each other and, quote, dissolve. This is how everything in your body is being transported. Not everything. Many things in your body are being transported. When you have a molecule transporting through your blood, that molecule, whatever that molecule is, is surrounded by water in the very same way. Okay? It becomes surrounded by water and is transported through your blood. So kind of have this word picture when you think about how molecules, nutrients, are carried through your blood. It's very, very similar. So that's dissociation, dissolving, dissociation. Chemical reaction. So when you take in lunch, right, sandwich, piece of fruit, whatever it was, Snickers bar, whatever it was, what's your body do? takes in that nutrients, it's got some protein, it's got some fat, it's got some carbs. Does it have any nucleic acids in it? Sure it does, right? You're eating some peanuts, right? Peanuts made of cells, cells have DNA in them. So yeah, you're eating, you're eating nucleic acids, but they have no nutrition value, so we don't put them on the label. But you're eating, you eat salad, right? Lettuce, green leaves with cells, DNA. We just don't have any nutrition, so we don't put it on the label. So we're eating all those macromolecules, and our body does what? Breaks them down, and then from that breaking down, it gets energy out of it, right? And then that energy is used to build up the things that our body needs, the proteins and the other molecules that our body needs. That's the basis of biochemistry. So there's two basic types of chemical reactions. One, synthesis and two, dissociation. So let me go through synthesis first. This is very simple. 
when A combines with B to create AB. <coughs> I also could have written C there, right? It doesn't matter. The plus two things going together. The arrow in chemistry, the arrow is key for chemical reaction. And what I tell you, chemical reactions always involve the rearranging of electrons. So what molecules will come together and what molecules will not come together is absolutely based upon the electrons. If they're going to combine in such a way that the molecules will be happy or not happy, will their outer shell be filled or not filled? So chemical reactions are absolutely centered on how happy the electrons are. So synthesis, taking two things, chemically combining them, movement of electrons to make something else. Another word for that would be anabolic reactions or your anabolism. If you hear about anabolic steroids, right? What are anabolic steroids doing? We know this one. Building up muscle mass, right? Anabolic. So anabolism would be where things are being built up, right? A plus B becomes something bigger, okay? So that's one way of thinking about synthesis or anabolic reactions. The opposite of that would be decomposition. Decomposition is where you do the other way around. You break it down. And now we're going to take AB, whatever that substance was, chemically reaction, chemical reaction, rearrangement of electrons, and now separate those molecules into their basic, more basic components, A plus B. The other term here is catabolism. And catabolism is the breaking down of things, decomposition. Anabolism, building up, catabolism, breaking down. When you take in lunch, when you take in a Snickers bar or a piece of fruit or a sandwich, what is your body doing? Breaking it down, catabolic. And what does it say here? Catabolic reactions typically release <coughs> energy. So as we take in large molecules, our body breaks them down and as it breaks them down, as it catabolizes those molecules, it is releasing energy. And that energy is then used by our body, right, to do other things. Well, if catabolic reactions release energy, what does it assume going back about synthesis reactions? They are going to require, usually, or use up energy. It takes energy to build stuff, doesn't it? And you got to swing the hammer, you got to put energy in to build things. So as we're building up anabolic, it takes energy. And that energy in biology is not always, but almost always, ATP, right? So there's energy, there's ATP necessary to build it. I'll, I'll turn it around. When we're breaking it down, we get energy out. Our body converts that to ATP. We get energy out of catabolic reactions. And then there are in some situations, reversible reactions. I'm not going to worry about this, but look at the double arrow. The double arrow tells us that these molecules can go either way, right? The chemical reaction can go one way or the other way. Now, the last thing that I didn't say here is that that arrow, <coughs> that chemical reaction, not always, but oftentimes requires an enzyme. And I'll get to enzymes in a minute. But enzymes are biological catalysts, things that are going to push along and favor a chemical reaction. Okay. So usually, not always, those arrows are requiring an enzyme, another molecule to make this thing happen in your body. Uh, this is too hard to, to see, I know. This is just more of a concept. Um, across the top, those green hexagons, each of those green hexagons represents a sugar molecule. Again, in this course, you're never going to draw out or recognize a molecule like this. But this is what we call a monosaccharide, a single sugar monosaccharide, single sugar molecule, plus another single sugar molecule. The arrow here tells us a chemical reaction has occurred. And what happens? The two single sugar molecules are now holding hands. They have a chemical bond between them. It's a covalent bond. And we've now made a disaccharide. 
two sugars holding together die. But look what's released. Water. When you build things like this, you actually create water. Your body is making water. In addition to the water you consume in your diet, your body's making water. As it builds things, it's putting water out. Now notice that this reaction has two arrows. That means that it's also possible for the disaccharide on the right to be broken down by a chemical reaction to its individual components. So as we go in this direction, as I go from left to right, get a different color on there. So as I, as I go from left to right, how can we describe that reaction? I'm building, right? Yep, so it's anabolic. Other word for it? Synthesis. And are we going to require energy or get energy out? Require. It's going to require, right? So it's going to require energy, usually. OK? Turn it around. If instead, I'm starting on the right-hand side and going to the left, if instead, I'm going to now go this way. Now that's a catabolic or decomp or, and it's going to do what? Require or release? Release energy, right? That's a very general way, but you'll be right, okay? General understanding. Perfect. So. Absolutely. So when we're going in the catabolic way, right, when you're breaking things down, what do you require? Water. Water in. Okay, so if you want to break things down, if you want to help speed up your metabolism, I mean, what do they tell you to do? Drink a lot of water. You want to lose some weight, drink some more water. It literally is important to consume a lot of water to break molecules down when trying to release and lose weight. It is, and I'll get to that in a moment. Yep, we're, we're almost there, okay? I want to start, start here, and we'll build on it a little, just a little bit more. Fair enough? Now, the other molecules on here, this, this idea of building blocks and breaking things down is the same. The top, that's sugars, carbohydrates. The middle, this is how lipids are built. On the bottom, this is how proteins are built. So this basic chemical way of adding and subtracting and building things is very common amongst all of your macromolecules. Nucleic acids also do the same thing. Questions? How are we doing? Should we take a little break here? Let's do six, seven minutes, okay? Six, seven minutes, and we'll come back, and then I'll entertain any questions, and we'll move forward. So any thoughts, any concerns so far? Ionic bonds, covalent bonds, atoms, molecules, decomp, synthesis. Kind of straightforward, but I know it takes a while to kind of digest some of this. Uh, moving forward, so how is it that these reactions occur? There has to be some energy involved, right? We talked <coughs> about how energy is released or energy is, is, in, is uh, required. And there's three basic types of energy, and a couple of them that are more important for me. One is uh, potential energy. I think of potential energy as the energy in sugar molecules sitting in my pantry, right? So your common sugar that you're cooking with is sucrose. Sucrose is the five-pound bag of sugar in your pantry. And you add that sucrose to a recipe, right? And you eat those cookies. And now you get from those cookies energy, right? That energy is coming from the part of it, from the sugar. And there was potential energy. And that potential energy was in the bonds. So as you're breaking down that sugar, that disaccharide, that double sugar molecule, sucrose, as you break it down, your body is getting from it energy. Eventually, that'll become ATP. That's potential energy. Uh, another way of thinking about potential energy is sort of a rock sitting at the top of a hill. And it's just sitting there. It's doing nothing. But if it were pushed, and it could roll down the hill, then there'd be energy being released as it went. So there's energy waiting to be released, potentially, but it doesn't yet get released sitting on the top of the hill. That's potential energy. The second one is kinetic energy. Once that 
boulder starts rolling down the hill, it's now moving, and that's going to have some energy related to it. That's kinetic energy. Kinetic energy was also the type of energy when you heat up the, the beaker of water with salt in it, and the molecules are moving more as a result of that heat, that's kinetic energy. And then thirdly, there's activation energy. Activation energy is the energy necessary to push the rock to get it to start going. So activation energy is the energy necessary to push a chemical reaction. So forget about the, ro the, the rock for a second, and now let's think about chemical reactions. And what is going to push chemical reactions to occur more easily are these things called enzymes. So these proteins that end oftentimes in ASE, like polymerase and kinase, these enzymes, are going to be the biological push necessary to get reactions to occur. And the way they do that is they, quote, lower or reduce the activation energy. So let me, let me talk to you about this slide, and then we'll show you a picture uh, with this activation energy built in. So what do you think is going to speed up or slow down how quickly chemical reactions can occur in your body? Number one, enzymes. I heard that, right? Absolutely. Many of the reactions in your body would not occur at all, would never occur in 10,000 years if it weren't for the presence of these enzymes. So enzymes, that's actually the bottom one, number three. Oh, I froze this, didn't I? That would help, wouldn't it? Okay, so the number three, the catalyst, the enzyme, is the thing that's going to speed it up, as you mentioned. That's definitely going to have a lot of an effect on whether or not a chemical reaction can occur quickly or not. Two other things. Number one, concentration. If, I'm, if I've got A plus B becoming C, and I don't have much of A, then I can't expect to have much of a reaction, can I? So if I have limited building products, I can't have much final product. So the concentration, how much of the starting stuff I have, affects it. Also, your body is very efficient, and it's not going to make things it doesn't need. So if you already have a stockpile of some particular molecule in your body, it's not going to make more of it, right? So if you don't have enough reactant, or if you have too much product, Either situation would slow down that reaction from occurring in your body. And then number, th number three, but the second one on here, is temperature. As a general rule, chemical reactions will double every time you increase the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius. This is why we want to keep our milk in the fridge, right? If you keep your milk on the counter, what happens? It spoils rather quickly. Will it spoil in the fridge? Yep. Just takes a lot longer, doesn't it? Right? And the reason we want to put some of our produce in the fridge is that it slows down the rotting process than if it's on the counter. The bacteria are already there. They're already part of the, the lettuce or whatever it is that you're trying to save. But if by putting it in the fridge, it slows down the decomposition reactions by the bacteria. And as a result, our stuff stays a little bit green, greener longer, doesn't it? So we've got reaction, concentration, We've got temperature and we have enzymes, all of which contribute to how fast or how slow a chemical reaction will occur. So here's a graphical representation of a chemical reaction. Here, on the left-hand side, this is where we're starting, and we've got to go up this hill. So we kind of have to push this ball up the hill. Now, to push a ball up a hill, it takes energy, doesn't it? <coughs> Now, once we get that ball to the top of the hill, we know what's going to happen. Once the ball gets up here, what will happen? It'll just go. It took energy to get it to the top, but once it goes, it just whoop, spontaneously goes, doesn't it? It's kind of how chemical reactions are in your body, too. There's a little bit of energy that's necessary to push it up the hill, and that energy to push it up the hill is called the activation energy. So the energy of activation, how much energy does it take to activate this particular chemical reaction. The bigger the hump, the harder it is to get it to go. The smaller the hump, the easier, right? The, the less energy of activation that's required. So here's what happens. 
with and without an enzyme. It's the same, it's the same picture, I mean, slightly different, but same idea. So we're starting over here. We're starting here. We have our reactants. It doesn't even say it here, but that would be like A plus B. Okay, the reactants. In order for A and B to combine, there's some energy that needs to be pushed. That energy is shown by the hump. Now the blue line has a big hump. E sub A, abbreviation for energy of activation or activation energy. And it's a pretty big hump. But it could happen. And as a result, if there's a little ball on this picture, right, we would get to the top, and then that little ball would spontaneously go down. With an enzyme, the red line is what happens. So we start off at the same place. We still have A plus B. The reactants are the same. We're still going to end up at the same place. We're still going to make the same products, C. So we're going to start and end at the same place. The difference is the hump's a lot smaller. So here, the red hump is a lot smaller. It doesn't take as much energy to get that ball to the top so that it will spontaneously fall to the other side. That's what enzymes do. From a biochemical, physical standpoint, they actually lower the hump. They lower the energy of activation. That's what the magic of enzymes is. Okay? That's how they do their job. This delta G stuff, let's not worry about it. Okay? So I'm not going to ask you about delta G. If you've had chemistry, you've been tortured by that enough. So we won't worry about the delta G, but just know that it's the hump that I want you thinking about, how much energy it takes to get to the top of the hill before it jumps down. So that's, that's a little bit about reactions, okay? Now, yes, there's an enzyme, but what else is going on here? The enzyme is necessary for the reaction to occur more easily, but I've also told you that what else is kind of dictating this? Concentration, temperature, and those electrons, right? Those little pesky electrons. Oxygen and hydrogen would not go together to make water if it weren't for the right arrangement and combination of electrons. Okay? Um, C6, H12O6, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens would never come together to make glucose, sugar, if it weren't for the right combination and arrangement of the electrons. <coughs> I'll be doing on chemistry. We're kind of done with chemistry in a way. That's the basic stuff. Okay, moving on. I've got another concept to share with you, um, and that's acids and bases. Again, if you've had chemistry, you know that there's multiple ways or a couple different ways to talk about acids and bases. I'm going to stick to one, I think, more basic, I shouldn't say basic there, more, more uh, fundamental way to define acids and bases, and it's the way we'll think about it all the way through this course. Acids, when placed into water, will dissociate, separate, dissolve, and release ions, one of which will be hydrogen, H+. So our definition of an acid will be something that when we put it into water, it will dissociate and release H+. The example here is HCl, hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is the acid made by your stomach to help digest your food. So HCl, when put into water, dissociates, right, arrow, chemical breakdown, and it breaks down into H plus and Cl minus. H plus is what I want you to think about there. If it releases H plus, it's an acid. For our definition, a base is something that when put into water will dissociate and release OH minus, hydroxyl ion, OH minus. Our example here is sodium hydroxide. NaOH, sodium hydroxide, pretty basic base. Okay. And so NaOH will dissociate into Na plus and OH minus. So if it releases OH minus, we're saying it's a base. A salt, by the same definition, is something that when put into water, dissociates into neither H plus or OH minus. So sodium chloride, right, our regular table salt, when we put it into water, what did it do? It broke down, dissociated into Na plus and Cl minus, neither one of which is H plus or OH minus, so we're going to call that a salt, table salt, sodium chloride salt. I told you that these negative and positive charged things are called ions, so H plus 
is a positive ion, and positive ions we call cations. Okay, cations. We all love cats, right? Positive things, maybe. Okay. And negatively charged ions are called anions. So OH minus is an anion. H plus is a cation. They're both ions, right? But positive ones are cations, negative ones are anions. Yes. So for, for acids, they'll have the positive? They release the H plus. Oh, it has to be H plus. Yes. Like H plus. H plus. We're only worried worry about H plus today. And so when there's two neutral breaking down, that's a salt. Yeah. When it creates when two it, neutral. When you break it down and you don't have H plus or OH minus, salt. Okay. okay. Could, could there still be um, negative or positively charged ions? Yes. In the, right, because yeah. salt and A plus, Cl minus. So we're not talking about plus or minus. We're talking about the presence of H plus or OH minus specifically. Now, this brings us into a conversation of pH. Uh, pH is an important concept. We'll be talking about it. We would have been talking about it in lab next week, playing around a little bit with acids and bases. And you'll be doing some activities online to help you with this. The pH scale is a scale that goes from 0 to 14, 0 being the most acidic. 14 being the least acidic. pH, one way of thinking about it, is the power of hydrogen. Okay, so this scale is all about hydrogen. Now, what you see on this chart, and what throws this off a little bit, is that's kind of an inverse chart. Zero is the most acidic, whereas 14 on the bottom is the least acidic. Now, this is a relative thing, like lateral and medial, right, or posterior and anterior. Um, things that are very acidic are, very, are not very basic, whereas things that are very basic are not very acidic. It's all a relative scale. So as you look at this scale, look how this arrow is broadening as it goes up. More H+. Plus. So the more H plus there is, the more acidic something is, to the greatest acidity of zero. Okay, has the lowest pH. Seven is right smack dab in the middle of this zero to 14 continuum. And the one molecule that you probably are aware of that is neutral in its pH is pure water. So pure water has a pH of seven. <laughs> Then, things that have not OH plus, but instead have more OH minus, are very basic. And the other word for that is alkaline. They're interchangeable. Something is very basic or something is very alkaline. Interchangeable. So let's look at some examples of things around the house or around your workplace that might be very acidic. Well, your stomach acid is very acidic, hydrochloric acid. That's that HCl. Uh, vinegar, lemon juice, sauerkraut, beer, all of those things are quite acidic. Coca-Cola is way down there as well. As we move up, yogurt, milk, in the sixth range, just barely, just a little bit acidic. Pure water, distilled water is 7. Your blood, 7.4. So your blood's not neutral. Your blood is slightly what? Slightly basic or slightly alkaline. Then moving further up, things like milk of magnesia. Why would somebody take milk of magnesia? Why do you take it? You have an upset stomach. So it has a pH of around 10. What's happening? You got an upset stomach. You have a lot of stomach acid. So now we're going to take some base some milk and magnesia, and what happens when the base and the acid come together? Neutralize, bringing us closer to a pH of 7, relieving the discomfort of your stomach. Going further up, ammonia, quite basic. Oven cleaner. You ever use that oven off stuff? You have to wear gloves, don't you? At least they tell you to. Okay. So have you ever touched a strong base? Have you ever cleaned an oven with oven cleaner? It's very slippery. Strong bases are very, very slippery. At first, it kind of feels cool. 
but then it starts to burn, right? <laughs> so those really basic things will start to eat away at your skin, but it will first feel slippery. Now acids, they're going to burn right off. They're going to feel very prickly, very, very warm, if you will. Not slippery, but very, very prickly and painful. Either extreme is going to hurt you, right? You don't want to go swimming in oven cleaner. You don't want to go swimming in Coca-Cola. Literally, that would hurt you. Lemon juice, very acidic. Um, so our body is not perfectly neutral, but is kind of in that neutral range. Blood being 7.4, our tissues also being around that 7.4 range. But most of the foods we eat are quite acidic, right? Most of the foods and things we consume are acidic. So our body's always trying to get rid of acid, and that's where our urinary system comes in. So our body's always getting rid of acid, and that's why our urine is quite acidic, right? A urine is not up there. Urine is going to be somewhere between four and six, three and six, somewhere in that range. So urine is usually quite acidic, trying to get rid of that acid out of our body. Your body also has in it buffers. Buffers are substances which keep the pH from changing. In fact, your blood has to stay at 7.4 pH. Okay, that's critical. If your blood pH varies, 7.4 is normal. 7. Point, I want to say, I want, I'm doing this backwards. 6.9 to 7.9 is all that we can handle in our blood. 7.4 being the middle. And anything above 6.9, sorry, everything below 6.9, or anything above 7.9, you're dead. Okay. So it's a pretty tight, regulated thing. Got to keep it pretty tight. Keep your blood, keep your pH from changing. Oh. Okay, sorry, I may have misspoke. So buffers are going to keep the pH from changing. If you have a hot tub or a pool, you put in some bicarb, right? Some some bicarbonate, some baking soda, basically, and that keeps the pH of your hot tub or pool from bouncing around. It's the same idea. Your blood also has the same sort of substances in it. Now let's try to figure out this pH scale. It is a 10, it's zero to 14, and it is a logarithmic scale. It's a fancy way of saying that each number on the scale, one, two, three, four, five, actually represents a tenfold difference in the concentration of hydrogen. <clears throat> so this whole thing's about hydrogen. So let's practice this. So pH of three, right? We're down here. This, this is the same scale on the bottom, except it's been turned on its side. So here's a pH of three. That's pretty acidic, right? It's pretty down there is how much is 10 times stronger acid than pH what? Each number is 10 times difference in concentration of hydrogen. So each number is a 10 times stronger acid. Okay. So pH 3 is a 10 times stronger acid than pH 4. I agree. Okay. I should see, I should see 21 pencils moving right now. Okay. So 4. Let's do the next one. pH 6 is a 10 times stronger acid than pH seven. 7. I heard it. Good. Now we can turn this around, right? It's a relative scale. pH 13 is a 10 <coughs> times weaker acid. Weaker acid, say it another way, stronger base. OK, weaker acid, stronger base, they're the same thing. If you think in, you can turn it around if you want to and say it a different way. So pH 13 is a 10 times weaker acid or a 10 times stronger base than? 12, 12, 14. OK, let's think about it. Here we are, 13. Starting at 13 right here, right? Mm -hmm. And we want a weaker acid than? 14. 14. Right? Mm -hmm. Stronger base or weaker acid? So 14. Is that right? No, we should only two the stronger I'm having a brain fart. It's definitely 12. Whoever made me think 14, no. Just, so let's, let's make sure we got this. So 13 is a 10 times weaker acid. Um, a weaker acid is what? Going to bigger numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So 13 is a weaker acid than 12. I apologize. pH 4. Now, this is a logarithmic scale. 
This is the same as the um, Richter scale for earthquakes. If you hear that in Turkey there was an earthquake of magnitude 5, and then you hear there was an earthquake of magnitude 6, it doesn't sound that ma a big deal, but from 5 to 6, the earthquake was 10 times more intense. If you hear about an earthquake of 5 and an earthquake of 7, the 7 was 100 times more intense, 10 times 10. Okay, so with that in mind, same idea, logarithmic scale, the same thing. So pH of 4 is 100 times stronger acid than 6, right? pH of 2 numbers, right? 100 times. 4 is a stronger acid than 6 by 100 times. So we're beginning to see that just a little bit of change in pH is a rather significant change in H plus, isn't it? pH 12 is 100 times stronger acid, a.k.a. weaker base, than pH 14. So what we see is that going from pH 1 up to pH 14, it's 1 followed by all those zeros, stronger acid. It's like our national debt this afternoon, right? It's huge numbers, things we can't even really grasp. Are we okay with this? I apologize for my little brain fart there. So definitely think about this, think about the scale, and know some, um, know some of these common things around the house that have high pHs or low pHs. What's really, I think, difficult here is that people will say something is a stronger acid. When something is a stronger acid, what's happening to the pH value? It's going down, right? And there's something kind of mental cartwheelish in there that we have to deal with. So stronger acids have a lower pH value, okay, and that's where the, the confusion comes. I'll have people say um, it has, well, yeah, it's a stronger acid, um, and, and sometimes they're backwards, right? They have to think about what that really means. So I've already mentioned buffers, right? Buffers are things that are going to help maintain the pH, stop it from changing. And so again, in your blood, you have, for example, some buffers that are going to help maintain the pH. Where do those buffers maintain your blood pH? 7.4, right? That's what your body is designed to keep that blood pH at 7.4. So you have buffers that help make that happen. Some students sometimes think that buffers make everything neutral. No, right? Buffers do not keep things at seven. Buffers simply keep things at whatever pH they're supposed to. So some buffers could keep things at pH 3, and some, thing, some buffers could keep things at pH 10. Okay, but in our body, our buffers are designed to keep our blood at pH 7.4. So there's that, that thing again. So as the pH value increases, it's really becoming more alkaline, isn't it? And when the pH value decreases, it's actually becoming more acidic. So there's that little mental cartwheel you've got to do. A lot of little concepts to deal with here. Water, pretty important, right? It's important for our planet, it's important for our bodies. We've already said that water is a polar covalent molecule, that it has a little bit of positive, a little bit of negative. That's why water is a good cleaner, right? You, add, you put water on something and what? Negative things can associate with it, positive things can associate with it, it carries things away quite nicely. So it's a nice molecule. Now water is doing a, very, a lot of very important things in our body. Number one, it's stabilizing our body temperature. All that blood that's passing through your, all that water that's passing through your blood and all the water that's in between the cells of your body is helping to absorb and maintain your temperature quite well. It's why in the wintertime, Muskegon's just a little bit, what, than Grand Rapids? Warmer. That big old body of water, that big old thing out there, Lake Michigan, actually holds some water actually makes you guys warmer in the wintertime. And in the, in the summertime, it makes you a little bit cooler, right? It helps to maintain the temperature just a little bit different uh, near the water. Uh, that water is also acting as a protectant, as a lubricant. In lab, right, we talked about the serous membranes and that fluid that's in between the parietal and the visceral layer, that's mostly water, all right? And that's going to help lubricate as well your tissues so they can move over each other without causing a buildup of heat. 
Water is also the main solvent in your body. It is what everything's dissolved in. Most of the molecules in your body are dissolved in water. They're dissolved in your plasma of your blood. So that means that most of the chemical reactions occurring in your body are occurring in an aqueous solution. They're occurring in a watery environment. And as blood transports right, oxygen and nutrients and waste products and hormones, this water also acts as a tremendous transporter of molecules throughout your body. So water is critical, right? For life, we know about it. Here's just a different list of why, at the cellular level, water is so important. I've mentioned in the atom to atom continuum that there's organic molecules, right? The other name for those were the macromolecules. And we've already said a couple times what those are, carbs, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. There's organic molecules, and then there's inorganic molecules. In most general chemistry classes, you are studying inorganic chemistry, right? You're learning about iron and cobalt and a bunch of other metals type things. That's inorganic chemistry usually. By definition, inorganic chemistry is dealing with molecules that lack carbon and are usually in size quite small. That's your general, typical general chemistry class. Non-carbon containing molecules, small molecules. The exception there is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, even though it has a carbon in it, CO2, is, because it's very small, considered inorganic. Everything else, pretty much, if it has a carbon in it, a C in it, it's considered an organic molecule. Remember, and we said that the uh, carbon was a building block, right? It had the ability to get, lay, uh, gain four or lose four electrons. So it was a great tinker toy for building our molecules. So that gets us to organic compounds. Organic compounds contain carbon. And we've already said these are the four major groups. So we've got four groups of organic molecules, AKA the four groups of macromolecules. Same thing. Now what I'm going to do over the next 15 minutes or so is introduce you to basics of carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And that will finish our chemistry cha chapter. Now, I may not finish it. I'm not going to push through this if we don't need to. But that's, that'll finish up our understanding of chemistry, right? what we've been talking about today. Not too bad, I don't think. So let's talk about carbs first. Carbohydrates as a group, as a macromolecule group, includes things like sugars, starches that we get from plants, glycogen. Have you heard of glycogen? Glycogen is a carbohydrate, a sugar molecule that you store in your bodies. You store it in your muscles, you store it in your liver, and it's there sort of like for a rainy day. So when you, where do you get your starch from? Do you make starch? No, we don't make starch. We make glycogen. Plants make starches, right? So we eat starches from plants. And it's the same, sort of the same idea. It's what plants use to store their energy, and then we eat it, and we get energy from it. Carbohydrates are the biggest thing for most people in their diet. If you look at a food label, you're getting a lot of carbs. And we're a very carb-heavy diet in our Western diet. And do you have to eat sugar to get energy? No. People go on Atkins diets, right? They go on low-carb diets. You can eat fat all day and get plenty of energy. You can eat protein all day and get plenty of energy. So you don't have to have carbs for energy. Your body can deal with making energy in other ways. But for the average person, carbs are the number one way that we get our energy. We're going to break carbs into three groups, very basic. Monosaccharides, I showed them to you before. It was a single sugar group, like glucose. Disaccharide, where two sugar groups hold hands together, two of them together. And polysaccharides, three or more, holding hands. So let's take a look at a monosaccharide. You will absolutely not be required to draw this out in order to recognize it. Okay? But by definition, a monosaccharide is going to be a molecule with three to seven atoms, carbon atoms, always carbon. And two examples that I want you to know, not to draw them out, but to know the names, glucose and fructose. So glucose and fructose are two very common monosaccharides. Fructose is getting a lot of bad news, right? 
I mean, fructose, we know when you, this high fructose corn syrup, and there's now a lot of evidence that high fructose corn syrup is leading to obesity and, and actually causes you to be hungrier and all sorts of negative things. So a lot of folks and a lot of companies are moving away from the high fructose corn syrup. It's not a natural product. It's sort of an enhancement. Glucose. When you hear about glucose, it's usually that common sugar molecule that our body uses for energy. So glucose and fructose, just know they're two examples of monosaccharides. Disaccharides, two sugar molecules linked together. I've already given you an example of this, sucrose. Sucrose is your table sugar. It is the five-pound bag of sugar in your cabinet. That is not glucose. That is sucrose. It is a disaccharide, and what it basically is Look at this picture. It is a glucose holding hands chemically with a fructose. So it's glucose plus fructose together. That makes sucrose. So guess what? When you eat sucrose, what does your body do right off? Breaks it down <coughs> into a glucose and a fructose. So I'm not trying to say that fructose is bad. We have it all the time. But that high fructose corn syrup, that additive, is where the bad stuff's coming from. But we have fructose in our diet all the time. It's also the common fruit sugar. So when you're eating fruit, you're getting mostly fructose. So it's not bad, just chemically modified can be a little bit strange. Then there are polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are three or more of these monosaccharides holding hands chemically. The two examples here, glycogen and starch. It's really what they are. They're long chains of glucose. Each of those little green hexagons is a glucose molecule. And you see that they're held together by a little chemical bond, a little oxygen that you're seeing. Uh, this particular cartoon is glycogen. So this is what you make, right? Glycogen, not to memorize this, just a long, random-looking collection of sugar molecules held together. You store this stuff in your muscles. You store this stuff in your liver. And right about now, you haven't had lunch for a while, right? You haven't had supper for a while. Your blood glucose level may be getting a little bit low. Your body says, whoa, we need some energy right now because your brain only can use glucose for energy. It's got to have it. So right now, your blood glucose is getting a little bit low. So your body starts to break down some of this glycogen that you're storing to keep your blood glucose levels high enough to listen to me right now. Okay. Um, and then when you're in times of excess, your body's making that glycogen. And when you're low blood sugar, it's breaking down that glycogen. Starch is the same thing, um, except we don't make it. We just consume it. That's why eating a, a, a baked potato, which is mostly starch, is really no different than a pixie stick of sugar. You know those pixie sticks, right? Those nasty. It's really no different. Your body sees a baked potato about the same as a three tablespoons of sugar. Because the moment that starch goes into your mouth, it starts breaking it down into glucose. And when you eat that pixie stick or whatever that crap is called, right? It really is just sugar that you're consuming straight into your mouth. So really it's no different. And what's worse, right? We take that baked potato and we load it with sour cream and onion and bacon and cheese and all the other things that aren't necessarily health, heart healthy. So uh, that baked potato isn't necessarily the healthy lunch, right? But we think it is sometimes. Okay. What's that? Dinner time. It's dinner time. I'm sorry. I'm talking about food, aren't I? Okay. Good thing there's no labs tonight, right? It's <laughs> tough on the lab days. Um, Somebody mentioned that this term hydrolysis reaction, and they jumped the gun just a little bit. There he is, OK? This idea of, of, of hydrolysis. I want to introduce this. We've already said it, but I didn't use this word yet. We can break these uh, sugar-making uh, equations or, or reactions into condensation and hydrolysis. But I want you to have a word picture for this. Condensation. In lab, we had underneath the stage the condenser. It's kind of related. Condensation reactions. When you think of condensation, what, you, what comes to mind? What's a, a word picture for this? The water. the water that forms on the inside of a lid of boiling water, right? Making some spaghetti. Or the condensation that, that is derived around a cup, right? On a humid day around an, a, a cold drink. So what's going on there? What condensed? Water, right? From the atmosphere, from a gaseous state, water condensed, came together to make the condensation. Keep that in mind as I talk about condensation reactions. 
And then hydrolysis reactions are the opposite. So water is used. Flip the syllables around. Hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, hydrolysis. What does that word mean? Hydro? Water. water. Lysis to break. So hydrolysis is to break the water. Condensation was to make it. Hydrolysis is to break it down. Okay, let's take a look at this. We've already seen this. So a condensation is when we're going to bring things together and water is made. Just like condensation on a pot of boiling spaghetti. You already saw that, didn't we? When we took the two sugar molecules and we put them together, we were combining and what popped out on the other end? Water, right? We made water. It's a condensation reaction. When you flip the thing around and we broke the sugar molecule down, the disaccharide into the two monosaccharides, what was required to go in? Water, and water was broken down, hydrolysis, to make this happen. So let's take a look at a picture. It's the same picture you saw, be well, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing, different picture, that you saw before. On the left-hand side is a, or are two monosaccharides. What's missing here is a plus sign. So glucose plus glucose. And those two simple monosaccharides are going to undergo a chemical reaction, arrow, to form a disaccharide. And this is your second disaccharide you need to know, maltose. Maltose is when two glucoses are holding hands. Right? Fructose and glucose made what? Glucose and fructose made sucrose. Two glucoses together make maltose. Look what happens. We put them together, right? We brought two things together, and what was formed? Water. Water. What kind of reaction? Condensation. What's the other word we could use for those reactions? Synthesis and yeah. anabolic, right? So they're all, they're all in the same boat together, right? So in your mind, you want to put together synthesis, and anabolic, condensation. Put them all in the same boat. Flip this thing around. Now we're going the other way. We're taking the disaccharide like maltose. Arrow to the left, chemical reaction. Electrons are being rearranged. Molecules are being separated. And now we're going to create glucose plus glucose. Now in order for that to happen, I had to have the maltose, but I also had to have some water. water. And water literally got lysed, broken down, into H and OH. And when, those, when that maltose is broken down, OH got stuck on one glucose, and the H got stuck on the other. So water was broken, hydrolysis, hydrolysis occurred. So the other words to go with hydrolysis are decomposition and Catabolic, right? Catabolic, decomp, hydrolysis. Same boat. Okay, put those two things, put those all in the same little uh, category in your head. The next two or three slides, I'm going to have you actually put an X through. Um, if you've taken a general biology course, or in the future, uh, if you take a biochemistry type course, you will learn in hideous detail how it is that sugars are the key molecule to creating energy in our body. I'm just not going not to go there. We've got plenty of other things to talk about in this course. I just want you to realize the big story. So when we take in sugar, right? Oops, I'm always doing that. When we take in sugar and oxygen, right, what are we going to make? CO2, water, and ATP. That's good. I took it out. I already took it out for you. That was good. I'm ahead of myself. Okay? <laughs> so just, just, just appreciate this. I wasn't going to have you memorize this. Okay? Already, I forgot I took them out. I'm used to saying skip them. But I, I just want you to appreciate this. So as you take in sugar, C6H12O6, that's like glucose. And what do we do? Every one of us, we take in sugar and we breathe. And every one of our cells takes in that glucose and that oxygen and does what with it? Makes waste product CO2, 
Our lungs will then blow that stuff off into the atmosphere. We're making water. Remember I told you we're making water by breaking things down. We just saw water being released as we broke things down, didn't we? So we're making water, and from that whole thing, we're going to make some energy. That process is multi-stepped. It's overall called your cellular respiration. And it includes some steps, the first of which is glycolysis. So turn that word around. Glycolysis, the breakdown of sugar. I'm going to stop right there. That's all I want to say, right? So that's where this stuff's going. As we take sugar, we put it into our body. It's breaking it down. It's creating energy. We're creating this thing called CO2 that we're going to be blowing off with the respiratory system, and we're creating some water along the way with it. Okay, so you don't have this. Do you have this one? Yes. Perfect. This is what you have to have memorized by next week. Okay, no. Of course not. Um, I used to have a shower curtain of this. This is great. This is your overall metabolism. You ever seen that shower curtain of the states, right? The 50 states, whatever. Everyone needs one of these shower curtains. You sit there and learn something. So this is a chart of your overall cellular metabolism. Metabolism. When you hear the word say metabolism, what comes to mind? Energy. Stomach, energy. I've always been told I have a slow metabolism. What does that mean? I take on weight, right? People have a fast metabolism. They're skinny, right? They use up their energy quickly, those darn people. Um, <laughs> that kind of idea, when we hear about that kind of metabolism. But another more cellular way of thinking about metabolism, it's all the chemical reactions that occur in your body. And we can break metabolism up into the two things we've already talked about. So metabolism are all the chemical reactions occurring in your body. We can break those up into what? The ones that build and the ones that break down. So I don't have that. I don't have that here. So I'm going to write this on here. I can break this down into anabolic, right? The ones that are building, and the ones that are breaking down, catabolic. So your metabolism is really a combination of all of your anabolic reactions and all of your catabolic reactions. Right down the very center of this. I know you can't see this, nor do you have to, but right down the very center of this, right here. Glucose is right there, okay? Glucose is right there in the very center, the top. And going straight down the middle, right down the spine of this wall of chemical reactions is the breakdown of sugar all the way down. And somewhere down in here, it says we make ATP. And along the way, what we're breaking this stuff down, what would those reactions be? Breaking down would be all the catabolic, catabolic reactions. We're breaking down the sugar. But then we take that energy, because every time we break a chemical bond, we get some potential energy coming out, don't we? We capture that energy as we break things down. And we take the energy that we're capturing, what do we do with it? Store it and or build. We use it. And so all these other categories on here, all these other sections on this chart are basically how our body makes nucleic acids, how it makes lipids, how it makes proteins and amino acids, okay? So that's the big story here. You do not have to memorize this. I will say there was a day where I had to have this darn thing memorized, not in this way, but in my graduate metabolism course, <coughs> I knew every single thing up there. I knew not only the names, but the enzymes and the structures of the darn things, and I could write it out for you on a wall. <clears throat> that's, that's slipped away a little bit. But there was a day. So when we look at something like this, sugar plus water, plus oxygen gives us carbon dioxide, water, and energy. That's that equation I wrote for you for cellular respiration. What's the reverse of that? Photosynthesis, basically, right? We're, not, we're certainly not a plant class, so we won't be talking about photosynthesis. But basically, that's the opposite, isn't it? Essentially, and then we all hold hands and sing Pumbaya. So it's just that circle of life thing. I'm going to stop there. You don't have this slide either, do you? Because I did my job last time. Good. And I'm going to stop there. And what I'll be doing, let's, let me give you just a 30 seconds of instruction. I will be posting a presentation that picks up right about here and finishes lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. It's really quite short. And then we'll be starting chapter three. Chapter three will be about organelles of cells. So we're done with the chemistry and the macromolecules and the molecules. And now we're going to be moving into organelles and cells. Next Monday, there was never going to be a presentation. I only have for you next week one lecture, the one that would have been on Wednesday. 
So there's not two lectures next week, just one. And we're almost done with chapter two. That means that basically you guys are walking out of here with almost everything you need for exam number one already. Exam number one, chapter one, we finished it. Chapter two, almost done. Lab one, done. Vocab one through 20, a few more note cards. You're done. You're almost done with everything you need for exam number one. Keep that in mind. That's a good thing, and it can be a very bad thing in that you just need to stay on top of it. And next week, I won't be seeing you in lab. No lab, no lecture. There will be one lecture, and there will be a, li a lab assignment, and I'll send out some emails about that in detail. Please go ahead, feel privileged, feel the right to go on and do your mastering assignments. There's no reason not to. So you have a great time, have a great long weekend, enjoy yourself, but chapter one homework is out there, chapter two homework is out there, um, and I'll send the email about the lab materials. Question? Um, if there's different types of sugars and there's different types of everything, are there different types of enzymes that we're going to learn about? Or? A little bit. When I get to proteins, we'll talk a little bit more about enzymes in the little bit that's left for next week's presentation, and, but they're all enzymes. Sorry, all enzymes are all proteins. They're all proteins, okay? You'll definitely clarify a little bit more of that next week. And those will be posted. Yes, I will post a lecture, and I'll tell you what to do with that, and that'll just be one more two-hour lecture for next week. And you're not okay? here at all next week. Tomorrow. I'm here on Thursday, but I'm not here on Wednesday. Wednesday okay. So no lecture on Wednesday. It'll be an online lecture. Okay. And lab next week is online. 